Good evening. I'd like to call to order the December 12th business session for the Cabarrus County Board of Education. We will move to 2.01. We will have a moment of silence for, be observed for Grace and Ratliff, a student who attended Cox Mill High School. Board members, we will go to 3.01, the presentation of colors. Presenting tonight's colors. Are members of the Mount Pleasant High School Flying Tigers Air Force JROTC program and their personnel includes Cadet Chief Master Sergeant Nate Deaton, Cadet Captain Carter Bonds, Cadet Master Sergeant Chase Anthony, and Cadet Master Sergeant Diana, Dianara Soriano Torres. Please rise for our national anthem. Honoring America tonight with the playing of our national anthem were members of the Central Cabarrus High School Chamber String Quintet and their personnel included Claudia Pedroza Cruz, Daisy Saucedo, Alianza Wilson, Alan Love, and Jaria Melendez Jimenez. The director of the Central Cabarrus Orchestra Program is Mr. Eric Landsberger. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we will move to 4.01, adopting the agenda. Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of adopting the agenda as presented, say aye. 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 Those opposed? The December 12th business meeting agenda has been adopted as presented. We're going to go to 5.01 and we will start our recognitions. We will have Dr. Marion Bish to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. 
thank you for allowing me some time to recognize some of our um, amazing and excellent people that work with us and with our students. We we'll begin by recognizing our assistant principal of the year. I'd like to ask Ms. Lacey Jacobs and any of her family who are here and administrators with her to please come forward. Lacey Jacobs, the Assistant Principal for Instruction at Northwest Cabarrus High School, has been named the 2022-23 Assistant Principal of the Year for Cabarrus County Schools. Lacey has been at Northwest Cabarrus High since 2015, serving first as a school counselor and most recently as an Assistant Principal. She graduated from UNC Wilmington in 2009 with a degree in psychology and completed her master's degree in counseling at Wake Forest University in 2015. Lacey is a graduate of UNC Charlotte's Aspiring High School Principals Program and a wonderful student, I might add. I had the privilege of teaching her. Lacey's colleagues nominated her for the award, and in their nomination, they wrote this. Lacey is a great leader who handles all her duties as an assistant principal but also makes time to help anyone at any given time. She's an advocate for students who consistently provides meaningful feedback and insight with all students' best interest at the core of her decisions. She's a mentor for all the leaders, staff and students in our building. How she treats others and her amazing work ethic is an exemplar for how a school's culture should operate. At Northwest, Lacey leads the instructional design teams, serves as the lead for building the master schedule, and ensures that all students have access to opportunities to succeed. She's been a pivotal leader in the implementation of a seminar block where teachers and students focus on their social and emotional well-being. Congratulations, Lacey. We are proud to have you as a valued member of Cabarrus County Schools and this year's Assistant Principal of the Year. We will move to 5.02, the 2022-23 Teacher Assistant of the Year. I'd like to um, please welcome Mr. Scott Parkin, Coach Parkin, and any members of his family and administrative staff that are here to please come forward. So tonight we offer congratulations to Cox Mill High School Teacher Assistant of the Year, Coach Scott Parkin. Mr. Parkin was surprised at his school on Tuesday morning, November 1st, with the announcement from Superintendent John Kapicki and myself. Coach Parkin began his career as a public school educator in the Charlotte Mecklenburg School System, spending three years at Hopewell High as an instructional assistant and assistant athletic director. In 2021, he joined Cabarrus County Schools in Cox Mill High School, serving as the YES Center Coordinator, Youth Experiencing Success, for virtual learning students. Colleague Catherine Sweeney, YES Center Coordinator for On-Campus Learners, described Parkin as an asset to our YES Center program, working through logistics and planning, providing consistency and structure with our students, and offering guidance and support to everyone. With nearly 20 years of experience as a franchise owner with I-9 Sports of Greater Charlotte, Coach Parkin oversaw the daily operation of youth sports leagues, summer camps, clinics, and after-school programs throughout the Charlotte area. 
He also managed year-round adult sports leagues and tournaments, establishing the largest amateur adult basketball program in the Charlotte area, partnering with the Charlotte Bobcats Hornets on occasion and earning the title of Franchise Owner of the Year in 2005. Coach Parkin now serves his school and community in a multitude of capacities, including women's basketball head coach, assistant athletic director at Cox Mill, and even serving as part of the custodial staff for Saturday schools when he's needed. We do what it takes, don't we? <laughs> Students describe Coach Parkin as possessing fatherly attributes who gives advice and wisdom to us. Students and colleagues alike recognize the countless hours he spends at the school in addition to his daytime work, including late nights and weekends, giving his all to his students, colleagues, school, and community. In Coach Parkin's own words, communication has been at the heart of each relationship that I have with students, which has put me in a position for students to be incredibly open with me. Dealing with today's high school students, communication and trust are extremely important, and I feel this has helped me to impact so many of our students. Congratulations, Coach Parkin, for receiving this honor and for all you do for the students and families in Cabarrus County. Okay, we will go to 5.03, the Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Kubicki, and our viewing audience, both here and watching live stream. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month for December. We always want to begin with expressing our thanks and gratitude to Mr. Tim Vaughn and Hilbish Ford for their generosity and sponsorship. Our Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month is Mackenzie Danley, a first grade teacher at Pitt School Road Elementary School. And at this time, I'd invite Mrs. Danley, her family, and members of the school's administrative team to come forward. And I'll invite Dr. Kapicki down to present the award. Tonight, we want to share the nomination that was submitted by a parent about Mrs. Danley. We're only a few months into the school year, but I have been so impressed with Mrs. Danley, our daughter's first grade teacher at Pitt School Road Elementary. She has shown so much care for her students, both in and out of the classroom. Miss Danley went out of her way recently to come to my daughter's soccer game on Saturday. She came to our game after attending two of her other students' games, essentially spending her whole day off rooting on her kids. The smile on my daughter's face said it all. I was also impressed with the way she handled my parent-teacher conference going out of her way to make sure I knew how to support my child at home. I just really want her to feel recognized. Today's teachers don't get enough credit. Thank you, Ms. Danley. Ms. Danley, thank you for the impact you're making to teach and engage the students in your classroom and those you tutor, and congratulations on your selection as Cabarrus County Schools Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month.
We'll move to 5.04, the Impact Through Education Awards with Mr. Phil Furr. Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Kapicki, good evening. Tonight we will present Impact Through Education Awards to students and staff at West Cabarrus High School and Culture and Webb STEM Elementary School. Our sponsors for the Impact Awards are our friends at Equitable. At this time, I would like to invite our Equitable representatives, Adrian Kaspar and Emily Satterley, to join me at the front of the room. Before we get started with the awards, please accept our sincere thanks and gratitude to Equitable for its continued sponsorship of the Impact Through Education Awards. We are in the 13th year of honoring those making an impact in our schools with this award. We appreciate your support and thank you for helping us celebrate and recognize deserving students and staff. We also want to say a word of thanks to our Cabarrus Regional Chamber and to Concord Trophy Center for providing us with the award plaques each month. Now on to tonight's awards. We will begin with West Cabarrus High School. May I have the West Cabarrus High administrative team come forward. Our first honoree from West Cabarrus High School is Trace Humberger. Trace, please come forward with your family. Dr. Snyder tells this story to everyone how Trace was the first person to greet her at West Cabarrus and convinced her to go to the roof of the school to help him with a promposal last year. His kindness to others is contagious as he is quick to step in, lend a helping hand or ear and give others his undivided attention. Most recently, he bought a pair of shoes for one of our special needs students to color and decorate. From there, he wears them around the school promoting inclusivity at WCHS. In the classroom, he is driven to continue his studies post-secondary with hopes to play baseball at the next level. He took the role of a leader of the student section, also known as the Red Zone, at athletic events and is quick to involve the youngest Wolverines who want to hang with the big kids at ball games. When nominated for this award, one teacher said, he's the heart of our Wolverine spirit and students gravitate towards his big heart and natural born leadership. Congratulations, Trace. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for West Cabarrus High School. Our next honoree from West Cabarrus High School is Taylor David. Taylor, please come forward with your family. Yes, Taylor! <laughs> Cheering section. <laughs> Beautiful inside and out. Taylor David is a presence as a Wolverine. She's a student athlete who has invested not only in WCHS, but in the community as well, leading a variety of community service organizations. She is the president of the senior class, the president of the Black Student Union, treasurer of HOSA, a member of Beta Club, student council, and a member of the West Cabarrus High School track team. Her daily grind is filled with AP and honors classes, all while initiating causes for the greater good, such as the coat drive and homecoming activities. When nominated for this award, one staff member concluded, Taylor is the epitome of leadership, grace, and grit. She represents our school and community and will represent our world with the same style. Her mark will certainly be made. Congratulations, Taylor. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for West Cabarrus High School.
Also from West Cabarrus is teacher John McNeil. Mr. McNeil, please come forward with any of your family in attendance. A former Teacher of the Year in 2011, John McNeil is a constant source of teamwork, positivity, and prayer for all staff and students at West Cabarrus High School. One of the original staff to see the opening of West Cabarrus, Mr. McNeil is the first to offer a helping hand overseeing the third floor, training student teachers, and assisting on the baseball field with a heritage he brings from East Rowan. He stepped in to lead his social studies department during the maternity leave of his co-worker, and you will find him on the sidelines of every football game and band competition supporting the Wolverine Marching Band and his wife, West Cabarrus Band Director Emily McNeil. A graduate of Pfeiffer University, his experience spans from the time in two counties where he has led departments, served as an athletic director and ITF, head coach in baseball, soccer, and golf, and a North Carolina Council of Economics master teacher. Of his vote for Impact for Education, one staff member said, John is simply the guy you want in your building to impact young people to do what is good and purposeful in the world. Congratulations, John. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for West Cabarrus High School. And finally, from West Cabarrus, is support staff member Michelle Pletcher. Ms. Pletcher is unable to be with us tonight, but accepting on her behalf will be members of the West Cabarrus High School administrative team. Once an effective teacher turned registrar, registrar, Michelle Pletcher represents the West Cabarrus support staff for Impact for Education. From preschool, middle, high school, and now support, Ms. Pletcher is a jack of all trades, master of all. It's just a matter of time before we have her pulling small groups for math in between registering children enrolling at West Cabarrus. She helps in every way she can in, front, in the front office and staff and students, especially those who know her from teaching, identify her as a source of trust. Her entire career has been in Cabarrus County, and when she became an empty nester and looked for a change but wanted to remain in the county, she came to West Cabarrus. Of her vote for Impact for Education, one staff member said, Every school has that one member who they can count on, and Michelle Pletcher is that person for West Cabarrus. Congratulations, Michelle. You're an Impact Through Education winner for West Cabarrus High School. <laughs> we'll now continue with our December Impact Through Education Awards by welcoming Culture and Webb STEM Elementary School. May I have the Culture and Webb administrative team come forward, please? Our first honoree from Culture and Web STEM Elementary School is Sakana Venkatesh. Sakana, please come forward with your family. Sakana brings joy and compassion with her to school every day. She is the first student to greet everyone in the morning and always does so with a huge smile. Sakana can always be counted on to give her all, no matter the obstacle. She is grateful, loving, generous, creative, and so much more. She is truly a model student and constantly shows what it means to be a Culture and Web STEM Cougar. Congratulations, Sakana. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Culture and Web STEM Elementary School.
Our next honoree from Culture and Web is Kaylin Leroy. Kaylin, please come forward with your family. Kaylin has a drive and dedication to learning that is truly special. No matter where he is in the building, the classroom, hallway, playground, or cafeteria, Kaylin is always doing the right thing. He supports and encourages all his peers inside and outside of the classroom. Kalen is an amazing student and friend, and he is constantly striving for excellence. Congratulations, Kalen. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Culture and Web STEM Elementary School. Next from Culture and Web is staff member Lauren Morgan. Ms. Morgan, please come forward with your family. Nurse Morgan is the school nurse at Culture and Web STEM Elementary School. However, she does so much more outside of her job description for our entire school community. Nurse Morgan can be seen regularly helping teachers with student wellness initiatives, teaching students within morning meetings on healthy living, and working closely with our student services team to ensure the well-being of our school family. She is a true master of many skills and always has a welcoming smile and positive outlook. Congratulations, Lauren. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Culture and Web STEM. <laughs> And finally, from Culture and Web is teacher Alicia Thompson. Ms. Thompson, please come forward with your family. Ms. Thompson is a third grade teacher at Culture and Web Elementary School. Her lessons and teaching are always engaging and promote a love for learning and excellence. Ms. Thompson is a teacher leader serving on many school level communities, hosting a student teacher, and organizing innovative progressive learning experiences within her professional learning community for students. She is truly a valued member of our school community. Congratulations, Alicia. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Culture and Web STEM Elementary School. This concludes our Impact Awards presentations for tonight. Congratulations to all our recipients, and thanks again to our partners, Equitable 
and the Cabarrus Chamber of Commerce for your partnership. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Furr. We will go to 5.05, .05, the Great Wolf Lodge Everyday Hero Award with Ms. Stephanie Allman. Welcome, Ms. Allman. Is it on? Thank you. I, first, I would like to invite Odell Primary School Nutrition Manager, Carrie baker Kiger and her guests to the front. For the last several months, Auxiliary Services has been recognizing our employees with the Everyday Hero Award. This award is presented to an exceptional employee within Auxiliary Services, which includes our Kids Plus, Facilities Maintenance, Construction, School Nutrition, and Transportation Departments. Generously sponsored by Great Wolf Lodge, the Everyday Hero Award is intended to acknowledge the outstanding behind-the-scenes work of our Auxiliary Service professionals, which often goes unnoticed. As we all know, there's a great work being done by these employees every day that should be recognized publicly. Nominations are submitted by CCS employees, students, and parents, and one recipient is chosen every month. This month's recipient comes from the School Nutrition Program, and she received not just one, but three nominations on her behalf. Some of the comments made were, Carrie is amazing with the students. She goes out of her way to build great relationships with them, as well as, Carrie has made it a priority to learn the names and likes of nearly every student. She has developed relationships and makes sure to give every child a warm, loving start to their day when serving breakfast. She also serves as a mentor for children who need someone to check in and support their academic and behavior goals throughout the day. Odell Primary is so fortunate to have Carrie support the needs of our dragons. And finally, Carrie is a mentor for one of my students and checks in with him every morning on his way to class. This helps get his day off to a good start. She then checks in with him again in the afternoon to go over his behavior chart and talk about his day. Carrie's formed a special bond with this student who desperately needed love, attention, and guidance after the sudden loss of his mom. She makes sure my student feels special and their relationship has helped transform his daily behavior at school. I'm so grateful for the impact she's had with my student. Congratulations to this month's Everyday Hero Award winner, Ms. Carrie baker Kiger from Odella Primary. <laughs> Okay, board members, we will move to 6.01, the approval of the minutes for November 1st, 2022. I need a motion for the approval of the minutes for the open session meeting on November 1st, 2022. So moved. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the open session minutes for November 1st, 2022, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, the, the vote passes. We will move now, board, to 7.01, board chair comments. I'd like to just welcome again our new board members, Mr. Sam Treadaway, Ms. Pam Escobar, and our returning board member, Laura Lindsay, as well as thank our board members for those that are starting on their third year term, Ms. Keisha Sandage, Mr. Tim Furr and Mr. Rob Walter, who serves as our board's vice chair. Thank you all for serving Cabarrus County School System. Each one of you brings a different strength, perspective, and passion to the table, which really creates opportunities for us to have a rich and robust debate around the complex problems that we face in our education system. So let's go to 7.02 and we'll have superintendent comments. Dr. Kubicki. Thank you, Mrs. Adcock. 
Uh, first and foremost, I too would like to echo uh, Chairman uh, Chairwoman Adcock's uh, comments to welcome Mrs. Escobar, Mr. Treadway, and uh, welcome back Laura Lindsay to our service on the board. And in saying that, I also want to uh, commend and congratulate all seven members of the board as we reorganized last week and you know we begin the new year as we always do with great optimism and uh, look forward to your leadership and all the support that you can continue to give us here in the school system. Um, that was very evident and, and it's been evident since I've been here that the this board and, and continues to seek opportunities and ways to engage with our teachers and our school system. Um, and today, before the meeting, uh, you know, our board was able to attend the teacher uh, leadership development training uh, and in recognizing those teachers that have put in over two years of time to better their leadership skills. So it's very appreciative. And as I spoke this afternoon, it's very important to see you all there. And it, it really sends a strong message to your dedication to the system. So I thank you for that. I'd also like to commend Dr. Bish for her leadership in leading this program. It's It's a joy to see our teachers engaged in such great professional development and you know the benefit is all for us and it's their time it's their commitment and you know, that there's no financial reward for this other than dedicated professionals trying to make our school system better and stronger and as i said to them this afternoon it's important because we need leaders we need leaders here tonight we need our board to lead we need our administrators to lead and we need our teachers to lead and we have over 2,000 teachers, so I think it's pretty fair to say that they are the number one leaders in the system. And I really appreciate and admire all the time that they take, um, considering all the work that they do to participate in that program. So I, I thank Dr. Bish and her department for engaging in that program and for our teachers for participating in it. Um, and I look forward to many more of those as, as we continue forward for our teachers engaging in it. Um, we have an excellent teaching staff here, and I really appreciate and value them. That being said, I'd like to wish our students and our staff and our families a safe and happy holiday break that'll be coming upon us shortly. Um, as it's said to me, kiddingly, there's one more Monday to go before the break. So we want everyone to be reminded that from December 21st to January 3rd, our schools will be closed. Our early colleges and Wolf Meadow will begin their winter break next Monday. And we hope you're all able to, to enjoy some much needed time with family and re-energize for the second half of our school year. Um, I wish you all safe travels to anyone that may be traveling throughout the, throughout the, uh, the, the Christmas and the holiday break. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all back in the new year. I'd like to congratulate again our teachers across the district who have been chosen by their peers to be their school's teachers of the year. Um, obviously, we have Aunt Ms. Angie McLean down there as, as our teacher of the year representative. Um, and she's fabulous to work with, and I get to work with her a little bit behind the scenes, and I'm very proud to say that it's a pleasure to work with you, Angie, and you represent everything that's good about our system and our teachers. Um, so to all the teachers that were nominated and selected from, the, from their schools this year and, and, and the winners that will be selected and talked about and announced at a summer in April, I congratulate you and I commend you for your, for your excellence. The Cabarrus County Schools Computer Science K-12 Pipeline put on quite a show on Wednesday, December 7th, at the Hour of Code Student Showcase in Raleigh. The event, sponsored by the State Office of Digital Learning, allowed students to showcase the coding and computer skills being taught in their classrooms and ran demonstrations of the coding tools. We had students, we had students ranging from kindergarten through 12th grade um, representing the Cabarrus County school system. And they were from Coltrane Webb, R. Brown McAllister, Patriots Elementary, Weinkoff Elementary, C.C. Griffin Middle School, J.N. Fries Middle School, and Central Cabarrus High School. Our students demonstrate the following concept. B-Bots, Dash and Dot, Scratch, Sphero Bolts, Vex Robotics, Hummingbird Robots, Microbits, Finch Robots, and HTML and JavaScript game creation and design. Schools were selected through an application process through the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction and Cabarrus County students represented it, our district professionally with energy and excitement that was evident and contagious to all. So congratulations to those students again. I continually say that we compete on the local, regional, and state and national level and this is no exception. Our students again continue to excel this time at the state level and they're being recognized for it. So congratulations to all of them. And again to our teachers for preparing these students to excel. Um, it, it has to be noted that it's our teachers that are producing these wonderful students along with our community and our parents, so thank you. Reminded to everyone that our program choice deadline um, for placement for the 2023-24 school year is this Friday, December 16th at midnight. 
To apply, please visit our website and click the Program Choice tab and then the Find It Fast section of the homepage. Also, a shout out to Amy Lauder. Congratulations to her. She is our District Director of Student Safety Wellbeing, who was recently selected to be a presenter at the National Summit on K-12 School Safety and Security. Again, an employee, a leader in our district representing us at the national level. This was the first of its kind virtual event to convene federal, state, and local school leaders to share actionable recommendations that enhance safe and supportive learning environments in K-12 schools. So again, congratulations to Amy and thank you for all the work that she's doing here in the Cabarrus County Schools. I want to echo all the kind words that were said this evening to Scott Park and our teacher of the teacher assistant of the year and to Lacey Jacobson, the assistant principal of the year. I've had first-hand interactions with both of them. I can tell you they are outstanding and well-deserving of that, that award that they just recently received. Our school boundary realignment um, RFQ is on our website and to all the public that is out there, we are accepting um, bids to that. We will keep the community and the board uh, informed of that. The closing, I believe, is January, I want to say the 6th, not, I, I believe it's the 6th, January 6th at 2 o'clock. And we'll, with all the bids, we'll close at that point. We will inform the board January 9th of the amount of bids that we've received, the vendors we received, and we will then go through the evaluation process and keep the board the community updated on that. Um, and I know I'm forgetting something. Uh, yes, and lastly, what I'd like to uh, say this evening too is I'd like to thank our Commissioner Wartman for attending the meeting this evening. It's great to see our commissioners here at our meetings and we welcome you and it's always wonderful to see you take the time out of your busy schedule to be here this evening to um, see what's going on in our school system as we work in collaboration and partnership with you. So thank you for being here this evening and, and uh, we do appreciate it. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Kapicki. Board members will move to 7.03 board attorney comments. Are there any comments? There, we didn't have anything. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you want to go over this handout that you gave us? Excuse me, sir. Do you want to tell us about the handout you gave us? Oh, there, there is a handout that Jonathan and I have both have worked on in regards to the Robert's Rules of Order cheat sheet. Um, it gives you some information. We thought that there were some some points that y'all may want to um, use as a guide. This is not completely exhaustive, but it is something that uh, can give you some, some guidance. If you find that something is not on the list that you are asking about, please reach out to us so that we can update the list. What we can do is duplex this and um, laminate it uh, so that you can have it up front and, and use it as easy reference. Uh, we'll have extra copies if you want to take something home. So. Uh, that's what we were planning on doing. Madam Chair asked us to look into it to see if we could come up with something. So this is what we were able to, this is the final product. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have a question. Is this available for the public to review since we're talking about it? Uh, I th yes, there, sure, we can get it. Uh, I can talk to Christy about getting it posted um, so we can put it on there. Yes, ma'am. Any other discussion about that board members? Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, we're going to move to 8.01. Our guest speakers address the board. So I just have a statement I need to read. It is now time for public comment. Each speaker will be allowed up to three minutes to speak, and an individual speaking for a group may be allowed, uh, allowed up to five minutes at the discretion of the board chair to express interest and concerns related to the official business of the board and the school district. The speakers will be called in order in which they, we receive the request. A person may not be substituted for a speaker, nor may one speaker donate time to another speaker. If a speaker runs out of time, then the speaker may leave the additional information with the board clerk. Statements reasonably perceived to be disruptive or in, intimately mm -hmm threatening to the orderly operation of the meeting shall not be permitted. Any limitation on public comment shall be viewed neutral. The board chair has the authority to rule the speaker out of order. If the speaker or attendee willfully interrupts, disrupts, or disturbs this meeting and refuses to leave after being asked by the board chair, then the speaker may be escorted out 
and could be arrested for trespassing or disrupting an official meeting. Board members will not respond to individuals who address the board except to request cl uh, clarification of points made by the presenter. With that being stated, we will call the first speaker. Is Mr. Russell Wright in the room? Seeing that he's not here, we'll move to the second speaker, Mr. Paul Wownish. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I have a deck. I send it to everybody. I think almost everybody here one uh, got bounced, but uh, it's certainly available. It's about 15 slides long. I'd like to go over slide by slide. It absolutely would take an hour. So I'm going to comment on it in general terms on the slides. So let me start by Madam, uh, Madam Chair, Board Members, and Dr. Kabagi. Um, I'm a Concord resident and program choice car driver. Uh, and you've all gotten a copy of the analysis I've provided. On each of the slides, or almost all of them, there is a hot link on the bottom to different places on the internet or through Freedom of Information Acts that I have acquired the information. Um, my, my start of this was I wanted to look at the financials and figure out how transportation fit into the overall budget. And are we doing enough in transportation? How might we spend differently? Um, Excuse me for bumping the mic. Uh, so I reviewed the 2021 annual statements uh, as they were published, um, and I looked at the 22, 2022 budget uh, that I got from the, um, uh, the director of uh, finance. I concluded the informa information shows that the spending is about 400 million a year, and about 70% of that goes into a bucket called Instrument instructional services. Um, my spouse would never let me say, I'm going to spend 75% of our family's income and I won't tell you where it is. So I don't particularly like the way that the, the finance is exposed to the public for us to get the information. Um, so I pass that on as a, a comment or concern. Um, if I, uh, so it, uh, the term I always heard is financial transparency, and that's really what I'm looking to see is how those things are, are, um, are, are expended. I looked at the CMS budget. I like, well, what's around here? What can we compare ourselves to? And CMS has about a 150-page document on every, on every uh, department within CMS, how much money they're allocated in their budget, and what that money is being spent for. Transportation was broken down into, I think, 10 different categories where they spent it on salaries, maintenance, operations. Um, so the next, the next category I go into then is program choice. Uh, um, CCS puts up, uh, I, I commented what was copied, what was on the web page, and put it in here as the de definition of what program choice should be. And CCS puts parents in charge of educational curriculum and supports the attendance through in-district board. Do I have permission to go slightly over three minutes? And that's all we have for you tonight is three minutes. Okay. But we do have the presentation, and we really appreciate you coming and bringing this to our attention. Thank you. I'd like to ask for clarity, please. So do I hear you correctly saying that you asked for an itemized budget and you did not get that? I believe that's what I asked for, specifically asking for what was spent for transportation. Okay, thank you. And it, it came, I, I'm sorry, I did get itemized and it was almost exactly the same as the financial accounting that's published, which is about 12 lines long for the $400 million spent. So it, it, it did add in their transportation of 22 million, I think. So what I'm trying to understand is you compared two budgets, you compared CMS to, yes. to our school district, and you said that there were things in our budget that you did not, you were not able to identify because they were not listed. Is that, do I understand that correctly? Yes. I couldn't find anything that broke down the 400 million. Thank you. That was published. 
and maybe I couldn't find it, but it wasn't apparent to me, so and I search very well. The budget documents on the finance page, you looked at those? Uh, There's a whole section on budget on our budget. I can, um, can I ask a question? Just a quick one. How, how big is that document? Because I didn't see it. Uh, there are hundreds of pages. Okay. I'll go back and look at that one. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, we will move to 9.01 committee reports. Are there any committee reports from our board members? I have one. So I had the opportunity to be a part of the Cabarrus Health Alliance uh, Community Coalition for Recovery and Resiliency. Um, and I wanted to let you guys know that they completed. Um, there was eight months of discussions about how we prepare to go forward post-pandemic. Um, several entities, there were students, there were Latinx population, there were elected officials, there were healthcare professionals, um, teachers, et cetera, that came together for that time frame every month, um, once a month, to discuss going forward. Um, they came up with a will or a chart, if you will, and some of the things that we talked about were communication, how that happens, um, if any natural crisis or pandemic were to occur, again, hopefully we don't ever have to experience that again. Health and well-being, and then resources. They have two beautiful documents that are up on their website, one in English and one in Spanish. Please take a look at it. I am hoping that they can present to our school district um, so that we can see what we all learned and hopefully help us in our own lives. Thank you, Ms. Sandage. Anybody else have a committee update? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to 9.02, our construction update, and we'll welcome Mr. Brian Cohn to the podium and Mr. Tim Louder. You weren't on the agenda, Mr. Louder, I'm sorry. He, he wasn't, and that's, that's my fault, so, <laughs> so I apologize. But uh, Madam Chair, thank you for allowing us to come to you tonight to present an update on the construction to the new board members as well as the returning board members. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview of where we're at right now district-wide with our construction projects. So we'll touch real quickly on Roberta Road Middle School. It opened this year obviously in August of 2022 uh, uh, to 950 plus students. Uh, the 1200 student school encompasses a 43 acre campus that uh, houses roughly 193,000 square foot of floor space. Our contract for that project was uh, just over $44,700,000. Uh, that equates to about $231 a square foot back when we contracted with uh, Shell Co. in 2020 of uh, that year. It uh, has to create outdoor spaces for the students and staff. Uh, we have shade structures outside for all these students. That was one of the things we learned from our, um, our uh, uh, evaluations from the Mount Pleasant Middle School project. Uh, has a main gymnasium, has the, the ability and capacity to handle all 1,200 students if we ever do reach capacity at that school so we can put the entire student body into that space. Uh, it does have an auxiliary gym as well, which we program into our middle schools. You can put about 85 people on bleachers in the middle school auxiliary gym for um, wrestling events, uh, for cheer practice and things of that nature. Uh, we have a large open commons area that's also a part of this school if you haven't been out there. Uh, it's kind of the front and center area of our CTE space and acts as a transitional zone for students that go to the cafeteria or their special classes. Uh, it also has a real creative media center space located on the second floor there. Um, very open uh, environment uh, with book stacks and creative seating for students to sit down and just have uh, independent learning time if they want. Uh, the image you see there on your screen is of the main common area with your CTE space is the media center on the left hand side and you have the uh, additional cafeteria dining seating there on the right hand side. Whoa. It's not working for this. All right, there's the auxiliary gym, my apologies. Um, you can see we have a fluid applied sport court floor, so we've uh, kind of gotten away from doing sheet vinyl floors in these uh, auxiliary gyms because over a period of years it becomes a maintenance issue. Uh, so it's fluid applied, so there are no seams in this floor at all. 
Uh, typical middle school construction type, we use structural steel, load bearing masonry uh, for our big box spaces, uh, metal stud, drywall like you would see. We try to put all the CMU walls or the block walls in the, the common areas. They're a lot more durable and withstand the wear and tear of a middle school. Um, we do have an auditorium in this school as well. We'll seat just over 450 students, so we can put one full grade level in there for grade level events if they need. Um, the, the auditorium also does have a full theatrical lighting and sound patch in integrated into the design. Uh, we have 48 core classrooms in the school itself. Uh, as a part of that, 12 of those classrooms are science rooms, so we have four science rooms per grade level. Um, multiple collaborative spaces where we can capture in nooks and crannies throughout the space for teachers to take smaller groups or sit out uh, outside of the classroom environment. It's just a little more exciting for the students to learn. And we were also able to capture some tiered seating space in the school like we did at West Cabarrus High School, two spaces that uh, students and staff will be able to utilize. That image there is a picture of the cafeteria. That's the entrance uh, into the main gymnasium coming from the bus lot. And then there's one of the two tiered seating spaces that we created. Uh, we obviously design these schools to allow to kind of section off the areas so athletic events can be sectioned off so that if you have evening athletic events, they, uh, you don't take a chance on the general public meandering out into the remaining part of the school. You can do the same thing for the uh, fine arts events that happen in the auditorium. Uh, we've worked hard with our facilities team and eliminated the majority of waxing that's required on our corridor floors. Uh, we do a no, no wax tile now so that uh, helps them in the long-term maintenance that's required of those floors. Um, the, the kitchen and cafeteria space has three main serving lines to accommodate all the students. We can seat about 409 <coughs> students in that cafeteria. Again, one full grade level is what we tried to capture. Uh, we were able to capture some creative countertop seating and cafe seating as well throughout this school. Uh, you can see there a picture of the uh, countertop seating we created in the dining area. And that's a look in the media center on the second level. And we just have some photo updates for you. That's the main entrance as you pull up to the school. And that's the front lobby as you come in from the security vestibule. There's a picture of the main gymnasium. And that's at the far end of the uh, main corridor looking back towards the front entrance of the school. And that's the outdoor creative space with the uh, artificial turf and some sunshade structures. Uh, and we were also required as a part of this through the TIA to do road improvements on Roberta Road and Cochran Road as well. And that shows the Roberta Road entrance, which is the main entrance into the school. I'm going to take over for, <clears throat> excuse me, for R. Brown McAllister. Uh, this project started in 2018, and uh, we looked at multiple sites, multiple layouts, and that sort of thing. Finally settled in on using the existing site. Uh, and the, the original concept uh, began, we final, finalized it last year as we began construction and design. The project is a total of 117,000 square feet uh, for a capacity of about 756 students. This, this project came in at $41,152,000. And uh, the project cost is about $350 per square foot. So you can see the construction costs obviously eased up over the last two years since we began construction. Uh, again, the program capacity is about twice the student, current student capacity at R. Brown McAllister. We started site work in 2022 this year. We've had really good success, had a great year. Matter of fact, we'll turn over the building pad this week for beginning foundations for the building, which is really, really good uh, in six months into the mm -hmm. project. Uh, actually, we have a standalone gymnasium and uh, <clears throat> with a dedicated performance space, which they do not have now. The reason the gymnasium is full size is to allow for the athletic events for the, for the parks, uh, and parks and recreation departments to be able to use that. We also have a large multi-purpose field outside that allows the kids to have plenty of room outside to go. And we have a dedicated bus entrance on this site now, which will separate the buses from the cars, which is very, very important for that site because it's very compact and that sort of thing. And many people ask the question, the existing school will be de redeveloped for future use and it will not be demolished. So we want everybody to be aware that that's the case. Uh, the existing Alabama McCaster property is 34 acres. We only use about eight acres with the existing site. So many people were really concerned that we couldn't fit the new school on that site. But as you can see through the layouts, it was pretty good. I'll have some pictures here in a moment. Primary design goals was to minimize the footprint of the building so we could keep as much open space as we could and, and try to buffer the existing 
neighborhoods as much as possible because it wasn't a very established neighborhood and it had been there for a very, very long time. We try to use a natural earth tone uh, colors for the building, a little bit more uh, architectural uh, to the residential architecture rather than just the commercial buildings so that it was been a little bit better with the, with the site. And I'd say our revised traffic pattern uh, it was something we've done this year to be able to get students in and out while we're under construction. We do have two construction interests. We call it north and south interest. The north interest being the parent drop off and the south being the school. With this, we have a little small video that allows you to see what it looks like if you drive into this site um, from the parent drop off. Here we're going down the main parent drop off drive. We do go downhill. This, uh, this school sits about 20 to 25 feet below the existing uh, school but it's so far back you really don't recognize that once you're on site. So you can see you, we have plenty of queuing, which is really important to the neighborhood right now. The neighborhood's being nice to us, but we are definitely taking advantage of the uh, queuing within the neighborhood. We appreciate their patience uh, during this construction period, but right now it's working pretty well and, and usually about 15 minutes total drop off. You can see we're going around uh, as our queuing space. You see the school is, is kind of on a small scale at the front because everything is one story and then we transition back to the two-story portion of the building behind so therefore it doesn't look like it's just in your face when you pull up to the building itself. Again the front entrance as you see there we drop off the media center there on your left. As we go around the building we begin the classrooms. We do go into a two-story classroom wing. All the kindergarten and first grade on the first floor is required by state law and then all the second through fifth grade is on the second floor. A little bit tough to be able to pair those as we have different classroom sizes based on student capacity. As you can see, it has more of an earth tone uh, look to it, so it does kind of blend in with the natural tree environment that we encounter when we're out there. Uh, again, we have a large courtyard in the middle. That uh, sidewalk you see in the middle is actually a fire lane. We were able to utilize that and be able to pull the fire trucks in that and be able to use it for dual purpose and not have to build a fire lane all the way around the building. Again, the south, the south wing there, and then you'll see the, uh, it's coming up, that's all of our utilities. It'll come in here in our, our entrance for the um, cafeteria and that sort of thing. And the two-story structure you see up toward the front is the gymnasium. And of course the bus parking lot, as you see. And it'd have bus uh, drop off under one canopy and then the parent drop off under the main entrance canopy. And the, and the video continues with you driving the bus in, but you probably don't need to take the bus right in, so we'll, we'll move on from there. <laughs> Again, the site began to look like this. It was 34 acres of heavily wooded site. Uh, today it looks like this. Um, obviously, you can see we, we did create as much buffer as we could, and many people kind of um, doubted us that we could put the school on this site as it did have topography challenges, but uh, we had an excellent grading contractor, and he's done a wonderful job of of leveling out the site and created a very nice footprint for us. <coughs> Again, this is a view looking directly from the existing school. You can see the, uh, the parking lot and parent parking lot and, and staff parking lot. All the, the materials you see is, is piled in what would be the bus parking lot and then the grading pad where the equipment set is where the actual building will be constructed. Again, this is coming in the bus parking lot to the south, we call it the south entrance, and it goes around the existing school and down into the site, separate from the parent drop-off. And with that, I, Brian took a... Yeah, we, we were fortunate uh, to be able to take our board interns on a tour a couple of weeks ago, uh, give them kind of an overview of what uh, the project encompasses. Uh, had two of them show up. At, um, we had to postpone uh, because of weather uh, previously, so we were able to capture it last week. Uh, real engaged and asking lots of questions about why we design things the way we do and um, you know the thought process that goes into it uh, you know we took them out walked them around the site itself the campus took them saw some of the construction activity taking place and uh, we were actually able to take some of them over to the uh, middle school to kind of show them a, a finished product so to speak uh, uh, giving them t two two pictures of, of what we do uh, kind of on a daily basis in our department uh, just some other things that we've been taking care of. We uh, recently had completed the uh, Mount Pleasant High School and Concord High School uh, turf field and track replacement. Mount Pleasant High School, as you can see, there is uh, completed uh, track striped and everything. Concord High School track is uh, all but complete with the exception of striping, which has been fighting the weather here for the last few weeks trying to get them in there to do that. Uh, we're told that hopefully by the end of this week they'll have the striping completed. So. Uh, those are two two great projects that this board approved and uh, we're uh, staff and uh, athletic directors and players and students are super excited about it 
Uh, the project we have in plan is the new Northwest Cabarrus High School project. Um, so we purchased land for this uh, school back in 2020 out off of the Kannapolis Parkway there at the end of Rogers Lake Road. Uh, we approved Marsburg Architects uh, this past July as the design team for this project. We've been working through schematic designs right now and uh, have a meeting next week to kind of finalize and see where we're at with that project. Um, this will be a replacement school, obviously, uh, off-site replacement, not on-site. Uh, we'll be adding an additional 500 seats to this uh, uh, site as we complete this new project. Uh, the total programmed area is going to be roughly 265,000 square feet, and that's going to be um, fluctuating and evolving here over the next few months. Uh, budget you can see for the constructions uh, just north of $105 million at 108.650. Uh, that puts the construction cost per square foot at $410 a square foot. So you can see what our costs are doing uh, progressively over the years. Um, again, program capacity for the school will be 800, 1,800 students, which will add about 500 seats. And the final project we'll talk to you a little bit about is we just recently put in a contract for a piece of property in the southern part of the county to build a, another high school. It'll be some quite well in the future, obviously, more on the five to ten year level out, depending on funding from the county. The property is located on 2427, about halfway between the Stanley County line and the Mecklenburg County line. It's about 75 acres. Uh, we developed several concepts to make sure it fits on the site before we went into this process to make sure that we wouldn't buy a piece of property we couldn't fit a school on. Uh, I know Midland right now is presently talking about maybe acquiring an additional property or adjacent to us here, a little small uh, mm -hmm. trapezoid piece up there at this corner that would may house a future library and, and a senior, senior center, center on that site, which would also allow us then to be able to spread out our driveways and be able to have a little bit farther distance between the two driveways onto Major 24-27. Right now, they're, uh, we're still in our due diligence period. There seems to be some title issues with the property, so hopefully they can work those out and the county can close on this property hopefully by the end of January. Uh, but that's all we had. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, file for this presentation is rather large. That's why I did not get up uploaded into board docs, but I'll be happy to provide you a presentation uh, individually and share it with you if you would like. So, Board members, is there any discussion, any questions? Mr. Treadway? I would just like to comment how much I applaud the prioritization of the outdoor spaces. Uh, I think historically we've concentrated, rightfully so, on the indoor spaces, instructional spaces. And I think COVID has taught us that the outdoor spaces can be very important too. So I'm just glad, I'm, I'm like the outdoor space at uh, Roberta Road. Mm -hmm. That's a great place. Yeah. That's a great yeah. place for kids, for instruction, for all kind of things. So I applaud that. Thank you. And we were very fortunate to have some savings on the project to be able to go to that project and look otherwise it wasn't in our original budget but we we're very happy to have those savings and yep. be able to do that any other discussion <clears throat> i just wanted to ask questions specific to um the car rider traffic and the bus traffic on these locations and i can probably do that in just calling you um, I'm really sure. worried about getting there and leaving um, sure. for car riders. Yeah, feel free to email, call, whatever's easiest. Okay, you. thanks. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Lindsay? Um, so, a couple things. Uh, on the Roberta Road, y'all, that roundabout about killed people. Okay, for, for the record, the roundabout's not our project. <laughs> so, the, so the roundabout is a North Carolina Department of Transportation project. Very early on, the state had asked us if we would consider constructing that roundabout for them in conjunction with the improvements we were required to make. But as a part of our design, the roundabout was not anywhere mentioned in, in the traffic impact analysis study that we were required to do. That is completely on the state of North Carolina and the Department of Transportation. And not to throw them under the bus, I realize that it is not the best. No, that's fair though. But, I mean, but it is what it is, and we just have gotten lumped into that conversation because of the work we did all around that roundabout. Okay. Well, that so, is um, good to know. Yeah. But we will agree that the roundabout probably should have been a little larger than Yes, the yes it should. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <coughs> Then with our brown, so I noticed no playground. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I just Curtis, saw the outdoor know, uh, piece. But back, yes, sir. Uh, we, we have actually two playgrounds. We have one for the kindergarten, first grade, and then we have a second one before. Keep going. Just go to the very. And uh, we can go back to the one site more. plan. Keep going. One more. Right there. So if you see on the right hand side the large multi purpose field, you see the three kind of brownish. Uh, oranges oh, yeah. okay. so that's a basketball court and two playgrounds uh, kindergarten first grade 
pre-K playground and then one for third third grade through fifth grade. And, and okay. right out the back of the building where they can access through that, you saw the, the curvy uh, sidewalk that went out there, direct access to that. And then of course they have a large play field behind that just for just general run around and be kids. Cool. We'd be crucified if we didn't put a playground. Yeah, yeah I know. I was like, uh, but I can't <laughs> see anymore. I'm old. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Kapiki. Thank you. Uh, just for uh, a, a point of reference, um, at, at the request of the board, I would ask that uh, Brian and Tim, that you both um, appear at every business meeting and give a construction update each each month sure. uh, at the meeting so that we can kind of be communicating with the board and our public as to a lot of the work you're doing behind the scenes. As you can see this evening, there's a whole lot going on. I think it's very healthy that we're, we're here talking about it at our, at our meeting and informing the public about all the work that you're doing. Um, I appreciate the work you're doing and how busy you are. Uh, but I also think that it's very a very good point that we uh, have a construction update section on our board meeting that you attend each business meeting, one or both. Yeah. Um, either you know you can take time or how you do it, but one or both of you here at every business meeting to update the board on the construction um, projects that are going on in the district. Okay. Yes, sir. That's one and two. Um, the Cox Mill project for the traffic um, plan that we had talked about a little bit. Can you kind of give the board a brief update on that for the situation, how you're alleviating yeah, so, that project? So those of you familiar with the Cox Mill area and the challenges that we face on Cox Mill Road with all the traffic out there, uh, we were tasked with trying to find an alternative solution on Cox Mill High School to get that traffic off of Cox Mill Road into the school campus itself, which we have been able to do. Uh, we have found available funding as a part of that to be able to go in and make those improvements. Um, it will completely flip where the buses and the parents enter and exit that school. Uh, so there will be some growing pains in the first couple of weeks till we figure that out, but it will allow us to queue uh, almost 2,300 lineal feet of parents internally on Cox Mill High School's campus uh, as opposed to Cox Mill Road. Uh, currently, we have about 600 lineal feet of queuing capacity at Cox Mill High School. Uh, one downfall of that pr uh, project is that we will be mingling the bus traffic with student traffic, however, as they exit. And uh, but we have met with staff and went over that process, and they have uh, agreed to give us a very short period of time. Once buses are released, they'll just hold traffic, release the buses, and then continue on. So that was the only thing that we could not solve was having three separate entrances for parents, students, and buses uh, due to the fact that the, the site was where it was. We were, we were slated to start that project <laughs> next week, actually, and try to have the bulk of that work completed before s uh, students return on January the 4th. And we would like to add that Cabarrus County was very generous in, in giving us the money. We, we get reimbursement from NCDOT projects, and we had the money reimbursed and allow us to use some of that money to go ahead and do this project now, which is great outside of the budget timeline and this will alleviate a lot of the traffic there in the morning so there's not a traffic jam on the front of the road and make it a safer entry yes, and sir. exit for for students and bus drivers yes, and sir. parents thank you any other discussion Ms. Escobar thank you very much for letting us know about the Cox Mill Road stuff yes. um, I know a lot of people who will appreciate that so just to clarify so the kids will go into school in the morning and leave with the buses kid, kid, yes kids are not changing where they come and go from that school okay because the I, buses and the, and the parents dropping off students right because right now a kid going to school has to sit in the parent line yeah. and wait 30 that, minutes until the parents go yes, right that will change that will change that. okay well that's great um going back to uh the roundabout um i know we're not responsible mm -hmm. for that uh, but is there any way that we can help with that because what happens is and i'm sure you're familiar with this because you go there all the time but you just kind of it just kind of sneaks up on you with the hill so i didn't know if there was like a school like i don't know i mean what signage are we responsible for so ncdot has put additional signalization as you approach that roundabout at all four or all three points because one's coming out of a neighborhood can, but i mean that's we can request more but well and i w my second question to that was can we re because our buses use it and from what i understand buses can't no totally clear it when mm -hmm. they go around it is there a way that we can request that it's in like made bigger or something well they did make the roundabout what, with what they call mountable island and it's designed to be mounted. It's mounted to be mounted. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. And so it does have a very, it's exactly what it's there for. It's exactly well, it's, it's definitely, you can see it. If you make it. the turn, your back wheel will actually mount up onto that island as it goes around and come back out outside. So that's not unusual. You're just not a bad driver. That's just the way it's designed. Well, I'm just wondering if, if for student safety, if we could um, 
maybe mention to them that maybe on the I have not sat on a bus that's mm -hmm. gone over mounted that roundabout, mm -hmm. but that might be uncomfortable. Sure. So we might want to look into that. Well, we, we can we can certainly address that <laughs> with our contacts at NCDOT and request additional signage possibly, but there's obviously no guarantee because that's a you know the state's discretion. Okay. So, and then because I'm new. When is the um, the elementary school? When is that supposed to be complete? Twenty twenty four is when it opens. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other discussion? Okay. I thank might have you. one more comment. Mr. Brian Cohn's fiftieth birthday today. <laughs> he came in here. He, he came in here on his birthday to make this presentation. So we want to make sure. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for being with us on your birthday. Happy, happy birthday. I enjoyed it. Okay, board members, we're going to move to 10.01, and we will have Miss Angie McLean up for our CCS Spotlight on Educators. Thank you, Madam Chair, and congratulations, Dr. Kopicki and my board family. Tonight, I will be spotlighting the Positivity Project, also known as P2. Earlier this year, the Positivity Project was brought before the board as a program to support the social and emotional needs of our students. The state required a social emotional program without attaching any monetary support at that time. As always, the board, our superintendent, and the Ed Center staff took action to do what's in the best interest of our students and implemented the program. Tonight, I want to highlight a few elementary, middle, and high schools throughout the district and their engagement with the Positivity Project. And that little cutie, he's on the screen with his little gotcha, a gotcha ticket that is part of the P2. Next um, slide, please. The mission of the P2 program is to empower America's youth to build positive relationships and become their best selves. Next slide, please. The project, the Positivity Project, has 24 character traits that students are being exposed to throughout the current school year. Character traits such as integrity, kindness, gratitude, perspective, and leadership. All, and I want to stress that, all of our schools across the districts are participating in the Positivity Project. But, uh, let's try that again. Positivity Project. This allows for powerful conversations within our schools, community, and within family homes. Next slide, please. Beverly Hills STEM Elementary has implemented the PT, P2 character traits within their positive office referrals, community, and community service projects. The middle photo is a picture of the fifth graders' Socktober project. They collected and donated socks to the homeless community. There are also photos of the school's restorative circles where weekly character traits are highlighted. Next slide, please. Beverly Hills STEM Elementary's MTSS coach, Anna Dowling, had the following to say about the program and its impact on the students at Beverly Hills. She stated that our fifth graders recently completed a service project that involved the whole school. That came out of conversations centered around P2 that they had during restorative circles. We have, even, we have also been noticing our students using the character strength words and phrases in everyday language. For an example, when we went to ZMAX, several students referenced needing to use bravery when they did the track run. I also heard many students talking about teamwork while working on their force and motion activities. Even during small group sessions, students have discussed being present and focused. I feel like lately I have also heard students using the words curious when asking about certain topics. We have gotten great feedback from teachers from each grade level about P2 slides and the discussions they prompt. Teachers and students also seem to really enjoy the Mindful Monday videos that showcase the character strengths and also showcase examples of character strengths being used at our school. Next slide, please. Cabarrus Opportunity School has also incorporated bulletin boards within the school um, that display positivity as well. Next slide, please. 
Culture and Web, STEM Elementary School uses the P2 character traits to recognize their students of the month and to highlight the CAUTCHA, I just love that, tickets to showcase P2 characters traits. Next slide, please. This one I loved as well, Concord Middle School uh, implemented the Positivity Project in their Kindness Spirit Week. Monday was their green uh, means go positive. Next slide, please. At Harris Road Middle, students completed P2 gratitude activities. And some of these letters, they kind of wrote to each other uh, to show gratitude and being positive as well. Next slide, please. Mount Pleasant High School has incorporated bulletin boards with P2 character traits throughout their school. One of their teachers has added his P2 credentials to his uh, classroom door. One of their advisory classes has created a kindness confettis and given them to kindergarten, or not just kindergarten, elementary school students. Mrs. Miranda and their media specialist, you can go ahead to the next slide, thank you, have applied for the Strict Dalton Grant to continue the work with P2. They have applied to create an art exhibit uh, to display in their atrium of their school with posters that highlight four students per grade level as they share major traits from the Positivity Project. Students and visitors will be able to walk through the exhibit to learn more about the positive aspects of Mount Pleasant High School's diverse population. I, for one, cannot wait to go and visit to see this display. Next slide, please. Here we have some cute little red hawks that were able to celebrate um, and receive a book for displaying the P2 character trait for that particular week. Next slide, please. This one, it, we're going to check out a quick little video um, of a few wildcats as they highlight the P2 word of the week for their entire school. So not to mention, they're also showing leadership, which is another character trait of the P2 program as well. If I had to say in present mode in order to get the video to play. If you can, it's no worries. Got to love technology. Um, so what I'll do, board members, I will get that video link to you, sent to you because I do want you to see uh, those students present because they did an amazing job. And I love the fact that they're also showing leadership as well. Uh, you can. Oh. Okay, here we go. Irvin, a uh, teacher at Irvin Elementary School stated that P2 has been a great addition to the classroom. The program helps the class to have a family feel and have conversations that wouldn't usually happen. It also gives students more vocabulary and to be in tune with their emotions. In the picture, students created cards for someone that they were thankful for. And then also while learning about others' mindsets, Kindergarten read the story, The Three Billy Goat Gruff, and the children had to think about why the troll would get, be upset. This was a great way to incorporate literacy and P2 together. So that's a huge shout out. Way to go, Eagles, and that particular activity. Next slide, please. These two beautiful young ladies from Harris Road sums it up the best for me. And I'm just going to pull my little mask down. I know my husband was like, oh, you can't do that because I'm battling with uh, cancer and chemo. But I want you to see my face because I truly believe that these two young ladies sum it up. Thank you to the board, Dr. Kopicki Education Center, and to teachers for continuing to do what is in the best interest of our students in our county. It's an honor to represent the work that educators do across our district. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great job. Board members, we will move to 11.01, the consent agenda. 
And I need a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented last week. And they are, are outlined at the bottom, the items on the congenita, um, a congen consent agenda. So can I get a motion? I'll move that we approve the consent agenda. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on any of the consent agenda items that are listed below? Okay, hearing none, we will take a vote. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda as presented, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Hearing none, the motion is approved. Okay, board members, we will go to 12.01, which is the action agenda. And we will have Mr. Legrand and Ms. Burns up. So the first point that we're going to talk about is the 2023-2024 academic calendar revisions. Did you have any other questions from board members? No, no further questions other than the, the request from Mr. Trataway for the calendar and why we needed the, or why we were proposing an additional teacher work day prior to um, school, uh, propose, proposing school opening a day later on August the 10th. And I just wanted to point, I just wanted to go over this real briefly, if you don't mind, um, Ms. Chairman Adcock. So on the, if we would come back on the second, have the traditional back to school meetings that our principals typically have with staff to get them all organized. Um, followed by Thursday and Friday, we want to continue our RISE conference, which was a phenomenal conference, uh, uh, days of professional learning for all of our, our st instructional staff. Um, and I just want to point out when the calendar committee put this, the, the first calendar together that was approved, that was prior to having our RISE conference and we didn't uh, foresee the need to have two days of RISE. We, uh, we have secondary one day and elementary the next. Um, we have so many employees, 4,000 employees, it's, it's hard to get everybody in one place at one time. So we split it up, up over two days, which is the reason for that. And then looking into the next week um, on that Monday, and Tuesday and Wednesday, we have a variety of professional development that um, has to take place prior to our students getting there, including uh, the adoption of some of our new K-12 uh, science standards, upcoming adoption of new K-12 helpful living, physical education, and world language standards, also continuing development of secondary ELA and social studies curriculum, and also letters training for new staff. Um, all of that, um, you know, is, is stuff that we need to have in place um, prior to our students getting there. And that's, that's in, in addition to the work being done, the instructional planning work done by professional learning communities of teachers um, and, uh, you know, just the everyday planning that goes into our students arriving on day one. A couple of things I want to point out on that, um, on Monday and Tuesday, you can see there the 7th and the 8th, there is an open house. And from the family's perspective, we, we always like to have two days for open houses. Um, and that is for uh, families that may have a, a student in elementary school and maybe in middle and they're not trying to get across to both of them at the same time and not able to, to spend the amount of time that they want to spend at each of the open houses and uh, just a convenience thing there. And uh, as we've said before, um, you know, this would increase the total teacher workday to six t total teacher workdays prior to school starting um, prior to this school year we had 10 teacher work days. So we're working with far less, even with this new proposal um, or, or this revision, um, we would go from you know, the four to six um, if we made the Friday also a uh, required teacher work day. And while this proposal includes one less school day, I do want to point out that we would be over 32 hours above the minimum requirement um, of 1,025 hours um, and the state of North Carolina requires for instructional hours, so we would we would be uh, we'd have 3.9 bank days over the uh, required amount, and ultimately we feel that gaining an ad additional teacher work day and making that Friday, August the fourth, uh, the the optional day required would provide our teachers and school staff with the critical time needed to be further prepared 
to receive our students on August the 10th. So that's that's the reason um, where we went back to the drawing board and wanted to make sure that our instructional staff were ready to, were best, uh, you know, prepared to receive our students when they come back on the 10th. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back over. Ms. Legrand, this calendar, that if, if adjusted and approved by the board, is still more hours than our current calendar this year. So next year's calendar, even with this adjustment, would be more hours than we are currently going under this year. That's correct. Thank yeah. you. Okay, board members, um, before we have a discussion, uh, I need a motion to adopt the 2023-24 academic calendar revisions as presented. Can I have a motion? I'll make the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So is there any other discussion, board members, about this? Ms. Escobar. Thank you for putting this together and giving us this much detail. Um, I just want to clarify, this, did, this um, adjustment was not brought back to the calendar committee, correct? That is correct. Okay. I would just ask that as a communication tool that it is brought, even if to give them a heads up or an email or something, um, just because this was new information to some members of that. Thank you. Any other discussion? I'd just like to thank Ms. Reeves for answering my many questions. She was very helpful and gracious with her time last week. Okay, board members, anything else? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of approving the 2023-24 academic calendar revisions as presented say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, the vote is passed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to 12.02, policy 2220, the of, uh, official school spokesperson, and we have Ms. Burns at the podium. Did you have any other questions or comments from any board members? No, I, I didn't hear anything from anyone since last week. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Walter, uh, since you asked for the policy to be pulled, do you have any questions or need any additional information? Um, my thoughts are the same as last week. I don't think it changes anything. I don't think it helps us. And then I think we've taken a look at other school systems and what their policies are in North Carolina. They're almost identical, and they keep this statement in there. So, and those are larger districts and smaller districts than we are. Um, so I wouldn't uh, recommend taking it out. I think it ought to stay there, but I think maybe some more clarification. Uh, is necessary, but at this point, I'm not worried. To wor I'm not really wanting to wordsmith it. I just want to leave it the way it is. So my vote would be no. Okay. So hearing that, uh, I need a motion to approve the policy 2220, the official school spokesperson. I'll make the motion. I need a second. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion about this board members before we vote on this? So we're just approving to take this sentence out, which was approved by the policy committee, correct? That's correct. Okay, yes. thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of appro approving policy 2220 official school spokesperson with revision say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. No. Okay, the vote has passed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, board members, we've uh, gotten to 13.01, and at this time, I need a motion to convene in closed session to consult with an attorney and preserve the attorney client privilege pursuant to General Statute 143 318 11A3 and to consider confidential personnel matters pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11A6. So moved. I have a motion. Second. Have a second. All those in favor to convene in closed session say aye. Aye. Those opposed? The motion to convene in closed session is approved. Thank you to everyone for being part of our December 12th business session. We will see you again in the new year, 2023. Happy holidays to everyone. Thank you.